program, and uh, we had prayer meetings separate. Now we're gathered together. We have a special, and we're going to have uh, the message uh, for this evening. But I want to just give you a couple of things uh, to think about for Saturday. We're going to go soul winning. We'll be meeting here at 10 o'clock. I want you to come. We had a great week last week. Several people Amen. saved. A lot of, of people lined up to come to church. And uh, we're going to do that again this week. Meet us here for that. Then choir practice, 1130 to 1 as they get ready for the program. You don't want to miss Sunday. Amen. It's going to be a great time. Let's go ahead and pray now or just go right to them. Okay, we'll pray to open this part of the service, and then we'll have a special. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your house tonight. What a joy to be with your people and to be around those that love you. And as we prepare for the guests that you're going to send our way on Sunday, as we, we take a special day to, to emphasize and to highlight the Lord Jesus Christ and why he came. I pray you'll bless our time together in the scriptures tonight, and then bless our week as we prepare for this great day on Sunday. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save us? so much. That was great. Ushers, what well, we'll do for the offering after the service, the men will be at the doors to catch your tithes, your offerings on the way out. And I would like you to go into your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter number 29. You men stay up here if you would. Jeremiah 29. And I want to continue preaching and teaching on what I've been carrying uh, as far as the subject now from a particular text for about six weeks. And uh, we'll get right back into that tonight. Jeremiah 29. Thank you, brother and sister Burrell. That was great. She did sign language. I love sign language. It's uh, It really is a beautiful thing. She said the great I am. That's the sign for God. And uh, he is the great I am. Amen. And I love that. That was tremendous. Jeremiah chapter number 29. We've been covering this passage of scripture for several weeks. If you are at home or, or in another place uh, uh, tuning in, we uh, want to remind you that we've been uh, on this subject, and the subject being how to live and survive in Babylon. 
We're not talking about literal Babylon. The Bible talks about a literal Babylon, and that is exactly where these Jews are, in literal 900 miles away from Jerusalem, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's the king. It's a wicked people. And the people of God, by God's choice, are, are, are taken from Jerusalem and put into Babylon. It's God's decision. You know, sometimes God does things we don't understand or even agree with. Our best bet when we don't agree is just hunker down and figure out how to stay where he puts you. You see, these people are for us a, a lesson, a real life lesson of how to live in Babylon. So long story short, Jeremiah writes a letter to those people in exile. They had already been dispersed out of Jerusalem, put into Babylon, and he's writing them, telling them how they must survive, how to live in Babylon. So that's been our takeaway from that example, and we're making it real time because we believe here in the United States of America, we're living in, as it were, a place called Babylon. A pagan day. I don't know how familiar you are with such media forums like TikTok. But TikTok has got an entire agenda. If you were to look into TikTok, I'm not suggesting it, but into that media forum, it is all about indoctrinating. Our kids are being indoctrinated. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, these are mediums, these are tools and, and people say, oh, pastor, don't be so old-fashioned. Don't be so narrow-minded. I'm not stupid. I know there's some good things about these things. Yeah. Yeah. But the lion's share, I'm talking about the large section of that media, is not good. You know that, don't you, church? It's dangerous, and it's indoctrinating. And so Jeremiah is writing these people in, in captivity. I want you to see in his writing, uh, he, he's telling us in, in verse number 5, and I'm jumping right back into where I left off. He said, build your houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of those gardens. He says, first of all, here's what you do in Babylon, settle in. Settle in, build your houses. <laughs> You're going to be here <laughs> 70 years. So you might as well settle in. We talked about that two weeks ago. Then last week we talked for a good while. Out of verse 6, look what it says. It says in verse number 6, Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. And, and folks, you can't ignore this. God says this, I want a godly population. He wants his children to populate. Now, I'm being real careful here. I, uh, my dad used to say this. If somebody asks you how many children you're going to have, dad used to say it's really none of your business. And that's the truth. But God help us if Christian people stop having children when they can and should have children. It's, it's a matter of God saying build, number two, strong families. And in Babylon, we have to have strong families. We ended last week. I gave you the five essentials of training. It was uh, sensitivity and discipline and flexibility, and diligence and time. And I'm going to move past all that. I'm actually going to elaborate on that just a little bit. Pardon me. Uh, nothing will affect our world more than rearing godly Christian children. Go in your scriptures, please, to Philippians chapter 2, and let's look at verse number 15. Keep your mark in Jeremiah, and uh, I, I almost pulled my, my marker out of my Bible reading. I'm, I'm getting ready to finish reading through my Bible a second time. I, I wanted to do it two times in 90 days. This one's translating into 120 days, and I'll get through before the end of the year for sure. But I want you to see Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 15. Are you there? Look what he says, that ye may be, what's the word, church? Blameless, Blameless and what else? Harmless. harmless. Okay, we're okay. That's what we think, right? Blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke. In other words, there's nothing sticking on you without rebuke. In the midst of a what? Crooked and perverse nation 
among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Folks, there's no greater illumination of Christianity than family Christianity. Yes. And so we were given an instinct, and I say instinct because a Christian wants to have Christian children. You want your children to love what you love and hate what you hate. Come on, church, help me. I could care less what your sports teams are or your, 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 your automobile choice or, or, or your demographics or your geography, whatever you want. I want my children and my children's children to love God. That's the desire of a Christian. And to pass that down. So what are we to do? How do we do this? How do we have build how do we build strong families in Babylon? Write these things down. Just three. Number one, pray. Pray. What do you pray for? Write it down. Wisdom. See, in Babylon, you've got to have wisdom. Especially if your children are immersed in the culture. I'm talking about the schools and the sports uh, and the jobs. Listen, I've seen teenagers fall apart when they get jobs. All of a sudden, now they've got influence. The first time I was offered a drink of liquor was at work. In my home, it was never there. But I went to work. And they said, hey, man, have a shot of this. The first time I was offered any kind of uh, narcotic was, at, was uh, in school. Does anybody hear me tonight? In the FFA, Future Farmers of America, marijuana, it's handed to me. I'm just saying we've got to pray for our children and pray for our families to have wisdom. And watch this next, pray for direction. Direction. I'm not with my grandchildren. I don't know how to direct them right now except what I know out of this book. But listen to me. There's something about being with your children. Constantly pray, God, give me direction. Because you have a sense. You have a sense and trust your instincts. When you're with your kids, you're thinking, I don't like the way you look. There's something wrong with you. This is what my dad would do. He'd, get old, he'd say, boy, what's wrong with you? Nothing, sir. See, I knew I was smart. I wasn't dumb. I'd say, nothing, sir. Uh, don't you lie to me. Get in your room. I'll be in a few minutes. I want to know what's your trouble. Yeah. Now, you say, oh, he's mean. Yeah, he was mean. Scared the devil out of me. Kept me out of a lot of trouble. Yeah. Trust your instincts and hunt that thing down. Say, God, give me direction. Man, I can say so much more about that. Uh, you're praying for wisdom, direction, protection. Yes, sir. <laughs> Look at me. Look at your pastor. You'd better be praying for protection. <laughs> you don't know what could happen in a moment of time with your children. I mean, just like that. You think, oh, not my kids. I'm safe. And my kids, and me, really? Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of us that thought we had it safe, too. And by the way, uh, you know I'm talking about my son's death, but I want to tell you this. I will tell you, look in you and your God-given eyeballs, I prayed for his protection that morning. Did God fail me? No, he didn't fail me. All I know is this man standing before you, six foot tall, 180 pounds, look at me. This man right here, thanks God, I prayed for his protection that morning, though God took him. How would you feel if, yeah. Come on. if you hadn't prayed that? Yeah. I'm just telling you, pray for protection. And watch this, and write this one down. I could say so much about this. Pray, God, give me connectivity with my children. Connectivity. You see, there comes a time in every child's life when here's what they hear you saying. Blah, 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 blah. Right. They all get there. Raise your hand if you got there. Yeah, yeah. my daddy was my pastor, and he, he'd start him, blah, blah, blah. I never did that to him. Let me tell you right now, I didn't do that to him. <laughs> oh, my. But I will tell you, lots of times, he, what he was saying wasn't resonating, resonating. You pray for God, give me connectivity with my kids. I want to connect to them. See, see here's, some, here's sometimes our problem. We're so headstrong, we're not listening to the Holy Spirit on how to talk to our kids, because we know what they need to hear. We're the dad, after all. Really? Well, maybe you need to pray, God, give me connectivity. Give me the sense to wait a second, think before I speak. Maybe God will give you a new direction to talk to that child, to try to get through their heads, because somebody's connecting with them. No child is a floating orb. 
in life, just some some orb floating around with no connectivity. Somebody's got their mind. You get their mind. Amen. I might be preaching to the choir, but that's it's good choir preaching. Pray. So pray. Then write this word down. How do you, how do you uh, rear, how do you how do you build strong families in Babylon? Write this one down. Disciple. Disciple your family. You know the word disciple simply means to instruct. Instruct. Uh, you're looking for a teaching moment. All the time. You know what I've learned, Brother Jeff? I can't help anybody unless I'm finding the door. You can't help anybody trying to bash through a wall. you got to look for the door. And J J Josh, get him open that door. Just push it open, son, please. Hey, here's what you want. God, open a door. A door to instruct. You're looking for, uh, you can be seated, thank you. So you're looking for God to give you a door. You're looking for teaching opportunities. Disciple your children. What am I supposed to do in Babylon, Pastor? You're constantly looking for opportunities to instruct, to disciple, uh, to connect to connect. Some of the best lessons I learned in life was just hanging out with my pop. I'll never forget one time he took me, Pastor, he took me in the woods and hunting mushrooms. Anybody ever hunt mushrooms? They used, that's a big thing up north. I know that. Do they grow down here in the south? So only the northerners raise their hands, though. I noticed that because the southerners are saying because we're smarter than that. Mushrooms will kill you. <laughs> but we go out in the, or, or make you real happy. Is that what you said, <laughs> Pastor? <laughs> wow. <For> Brother Thomas. <laughs> Brother Thomas. <laughs> Walking through those woods, hunting mushrooms. Here's what, I, here's what I learned at about 16 years old, to shut my mouth and listen to my pop. Come on. Come on. I would give anything to shut my mouth and listen to my pop again. Because there's the, the enormous amount of common sense that just dribbled out of that man walking along with him and hearing him with his, his vernacular. There's something about the way they talk from the 1930s and 40s. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. And, and connectivity. And you, you know where this is going, right? Because you can't connect somebody you're not spending time with. That's right. Spending time with. Amen. Uh, my son Joseph is, of course, my only son on the earth. And uh, when we're together, it's all about the grandkids. But this past time I was out there, and I'll see him at Christmas, and I'll see both, all three of my kids at Christmas. Thank the Lord. We're very blessed. But Joseph said to me, Pop, can we go off together? You know what he's doing? Wanting to spend time with his dad. You know what I do when I'm with him? I talk. I talk. And our problem is we don't talk to our kids and with our kids and put it in their brains. I'm saying to you to build strong families in Babylon. They've got a giant uh, concert going into their heads all the time of music and voices and media. And if we don't get our words in them, we're not connecting. How do you save your families? You open your mouth and talk and not tear down, but talk. It's called discipleship. You see what needs to happen. And, and man, I'm telling you, this is so, so deep. If you don't give them the right worldview, they've got a worldview from somewhere else. My father was not trained to be a good husband. My father was an awful father. His, his dad was a drunk. And the only way my dad knew how to deal with us was like drunks. And please, I don't want to hurt anybody, but if you grew up in a drunkard's home, it was not happy. And it wasn't peaceful. And it wasn't loving. It was angry. And, and, and uh, I have to tell you something. For, for a large part of my rearing, I'm letting you in on some stuff here. A large part of my rearing, it was nothing but overt anger. You're going to read your Bible. Did you hear me? Get in there and read your Bible. It's just not really the best way to get your kids to read the Bible. But that's how he did it. And, and it was just the way it was. You say, well, why say that? Dad didn't know how to do it. But somehow, are you people listening to me? Somehow, out of that 
that foam of anger. I was able to suck some truth. And as a little kid, a young teenager, I was able to extract out of the, the fury of a man that didn't know what he was doing. And, and don't think I'm bashing my father. My father was the greatest man I ever knew in my whole, my whole life. But he didn't know how to rear children for a large part of it. I will tell you this, what he did do is he banged into my head the right worldview. Here's what he'd tell me. Son, this world will hand you nothing but pain, misery, and sorrow. He'd walk with me and he'd say, Son, your dad was a drunk at one time and I smoked cigarettes and I used to cuss like a mule skinner and I never touched your mother but I was angry. And, he'd, and all of a sudden he'd start weeping and he'd say, Now that Jesus came in my life, now Jesus is part of my life, I got the joy of the Lord. Boy, you don't know what I had. You know what I got from him? The right worldview. Anybody hearing me tonight? Anybody know exactly what I'm talking about? You can look at the, the A.D. and B.C., before Christ and after Christ in your life. I, I, my my father-in-law uh, was a drunkard most of my wife's life, all of his life. Uh, he was a successful drunk. <laughs> and, uh, but now he's saved. You know what he does when he talks to me? He, he thanks me for praying for him. Yeah, he's got to walk with God now. I'm just telling you, if you don't spend time with your children and pump into their brains the worldview, I'm talking about your kids, and your grandkids are getting it from somewhere else. And so when my grandkids talk to me, it isn't about just fun. It's about me putting thoughts in their heads. I want my grandkids to get a worldview, a proper worldview. That's how you survive in Babylon. Otherwise, you might as well give up and become a Babylonian. Yeah. Mm. I'm not signing up for that. Amen. See what you have to do. I hope you write this down. Your goal is to establish the biblical perspective to every cultural and political issue. I promise you, our children today are being hit with transgenderism and single parenting and live-in parenting they said the divorce rate is right or falling you want to know why because people aren't marrying anymore they're just living together you've got to promote a proper biblical worldview to your children or you're going to lose them to babylon you say, well, Pastor, I did all that. Yeah, let me tell you what. Let me tell you something. I'm going to sum this up. How do you describe rearing children in Babylon? With great difficulty. Yes. That's how you describe it. Yes. There are people in this room, we could raise our hands and say, we did it right, we did everything we could, and they still chose otherwise. That's because we're living in Babylon. And don't give up. The end is not there yet. I'm telling you something. Listen to me. Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham. His son, his Billy Graham, right, the greatest evangelist, they say in the history of the world, more people saved under his ministry than anybody in the world. That's what they say. Over 100 million people claim to have been saved in his campaigns across the earth. Franklin Graham grew up and became a drunk, used drugs, and on and on and on he did until one day the Holy Ghost of heaven got a hold of him and jerked his chain. And I'm not promoting anything, that I'm just saying this, that Billy Graham was brokenhearted because of Franklin. But guess who's today carrying the torch for Billy Graham? His son! Yeah. Don't give up. Yeah. Don't give up. Yes. Now let me just give you, let me give you six things about what I'm saying to you, just to encourage you. I'm trying to help you, amen? amen. There's nothing new. Nothing new. What I'm preaching tonight used to be preached in the 1700s. And the 1300s. And the 100s after Jesus. Nothing new. Sin always causes something. Sin always causes something. You might want to write that down because I want to tell you something. That's about as profound as you're ever going to get on sin. Sin always causes something. Sin doesn't just take place. It always, it's like yeast. Yeast causes something, right? Uh, bacon causes something. Can I hear an amen right there? <laughs> Sin always causes something. Write this down. There's a real devil. There is a real devil. A real devil. And write this down. These, these just little things to help you. We are at war. Yes, sir. 
in Babylon, we're at war. You say, well, I thought we were captives. Yep, but we're not giving up. We're at war. Now, write this down. Your kids are being told this. They think this. They know this, that there's always another way. There's always another way. Train up a child the way he should go to winners or not depart from it. That is not a promise. It's a principle. Did you hear what I just said? It's a principle. And every child is going to choose their way. And it's good to remember there's always another way. Uh, let, me, let me give you this finally. You've got to continue to remember this as a Christian. Rearing children in Babylon, you must have absolutes. Absolutes. In other words, what is right is right, what is wrong is wrong, and you're not going to be blase about it. It's black or white. Yeah, sure. Amen? Yeah, sure. What are you going to do if one of your children or your grandchildren becomes a homosexual? There's still absolutes. Yeah. Yeah. I said there's still absolutes. Yeah. You have to be absolutely convinced what this Bible says. And then write this down. So pray, disciple, and protect. Protect. Here's how you protect. It's real simple. Huh. Uh, remember the phone, the television, the cable, the social media. You've got to protect on those things. You know I'm telling the truth. Children are not just victims, they're targets today. <laughs> Pedophilia is a growing industry in the United States. It's growing. The LGBT crowd are targeting young people. There is a website now dedicated to trans kids. Wait a minute, let me rephrase that. There are many websites dedicated to trans kids, and they're even communicated at the public schools. You've got to watch your children. I'm talking about protecting your children. Are you still listen to church? I got three minutes. You've got to protect your children. I said three minutes. You saw that? Watch your children. Here it is, in public and in private. Teach them how to watch, oh, pardon me, teach them how to respond to questionable situations and strangers, even with those that maybe you think we should be able to trust. And I'm talking about schools, camps, churches, youth groups, uh, sporting events, sleepovers, if you do that. I'm saying teach your children how to respond to those things. And none of this should surprise us. None of this should be uh, uh, new in our minds. This has been forever. It's just that we got used to living in Babylon. Uh, anybody ever thought about Sodom and Gomorrah, how bad that was? Yeah. Now, Lot was there. He shouldn't have been there, in my opinion, but he was there, nevertheless, and he lost. Yeah. Noah's day is another one. Folks, this is not the time to fear, and I'm going to close with this. This is not the time to fear. Psalm 46, 1, the Lord is a present help in time of trouble. Present help. Yeah. Romans 8, 28, you know that great, great verse, and we know that all things work together. It means we have no need to fear. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. I've given you the scriptures to look down because my time is up. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. It tells us there that his strength is made perfect in what? Our weaknesses. And so we, we build strong families. And I'm going to close by telling you, don't give over the training of your children to anybody. Amen. Education's one thing. They've got to learn math science and history and geography and, and, and literature and all those things, but training is something you do not delegate to anybody. It's what we must do. How do you do it? Repetitive, repetitive, repetitive training. And I want to tell you something. Here, write this down. Deuteronomy chapters 6 and 11. Those two chapters. Deuteronomy 6 and 11 are the Mayflower Compact, if you will. Uh, they are the the Bill of Rights, if you will. They are the constitution of dads rearing children. Folks, the way God set it up is that the man is to lead the home. He is to be the initiator. He is to be the, ins the inspector. He is to be the motivator. And dad, you've got to never give up the training of your children to anybody or anything. I'll close with this. My son Eric was uh, got his first job and uh, was delivering pizzas. And uh, one time... I got in his car. Yeah, I got in his car. I had a key to his car. And I turned his car on and wanted to hear what he was listening to on the radio. And it was not good music. So I dealt with him. It's none of your business how I dealt with him, but let me tell you, I dealt with him. Another time, he came home and he knew I had his key. And I went out to his car and I checked his radio. And it was not good music for the second time. He came home. 
I sat him down and said, and I was weeping. I said, boy, I found your car, and you know I checked your car, and I found your radio. And he said, Dad, I'm telling you it wasn't me. And he started telling me what happened. But he said, and I'm going to tell you what happened because I'm going to get in greater trouble than with the radio. I said, tell me. He said, there was a kid at work. His car broke down. He used my car to deliver pizzas. Now, he was a double whammy here. Because I told him, I said, don't you let anybody ever drive your car. He said, but Dad, this kid needed to use the car. And Dad, I'm telling you, I didn't turn that music on. He did. And so I, had to, I was in a conundrum here. What do I do? I let him off the hook is what I did. Amen. What am I trying to say is you just don't give up. Don't give up. Not long after that, I walked by his bedroom late at night. We just built our beautiful home, and I'm done. And uh, Eric had his own room. And, you know, he had his own, his own odor, too. All these kids have a certain stench about them. <laughs> had a certain odor about him. And you know what I'm talking about, these teenage boys. And uh, he was about 17 this time. His light was on. And I knew he was kind of liking a, a, a little girl from another church and I'm thinking he's talking to her on the phone. And so I eased up to the door like dads do. And I didn't, I didn't uh, walk in, but I knocked real quick, and I opened the door. I said, I'm coming in. And I found my boy on his knees praying on his bed with his light on. I'll tell you something. Don't you ever give up. Now, he's with the Lord tonight. Those are precious memories to me. I'm glad that we didn't go down fighting. We went down loving because I didn't give up on my kids. Now, they're long gone now. But I want to say this. Whatever you've got in your hands, you make well use of the time you have. Don't give up. Build strong families in Babylon. I want to talk about marriage tonight, too. We'll stop right there. Let's bow together, please. Let's all stand together. Us, as you come ahead, grab these plates with our heads bowed nice closed. Let's stand together. I'm going to pray, then I'm going to dismiss. Our Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you that nothing going on in this world is surprising or unusual to you. You are God Almighty, and you're in complete control. And Lord, I want to pray for your people tonight as we go into the Christmas break and families will be together more than usual. I pray that we'll take every bit of opportunity to love one another, wrap our arms around each other literally and figuratively, and love and walk together and enjoy every moment and sing and look at the beauty of each day as a gift from heaven. Thank you for the precious families in this church. Precious mom and dad and children, grandchildren, husbands and wives. Even our singles, they have loving families. God, may we just give it all we've got living in Babylon. In Jesus' name, amen. How many got a blessing tonight? Thank you. I got a blessing because you came to church. Uh, listen, let's make sure we're involved in everything we can. Saturday morning, uh, uh, Christmas caroling Friday night. If you can come, we're going to drive the shuttle, and it'll be a lot of fun. It's all on the schedule. And then, of course, uh, uh, the rehearsal and all. So God bless you. You're dismissed, church.